Hi, welcome to our video on enzymes. Enzymes are a really big deal in cellular metabolism because they are the molecules that control and carry out almost every aspect of the metabolic reactions that happen inside of every cell on the planet. Catalase, the molecule that you see here, is an example of an enzyme, and just like any other enzyme, it does something really important for living systems. The question that we're going to answer in this video is how do enzymes function in living systems? We're going to talk about what enzymes are, how enzymes work, the effects of variables on enzyme structure and function, and how cells regulate enzyme activity. Enzymes are catalysts. They are the molecules that are responsible for controlling many of the reactions that take place inside of cells. The catalase enzyme controls this reaction in cells, the conversion of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen, which is an exergonic process. In order to understand how catalysts work, we should really look at a free energy diagram. We'll put free energy on our y-axis and look at time, which we'll call the reaction coordinate, on our x-axis. Let's use the catalase reaction as our example, but all chemical reactions work the same way. They convert reactants into products. But the energetics of a reaction are not just a straight line. In order for reactants to react, they have to be placed into a high energy state. Once reactants enter into that state, known as the transition state, the reaction will then occur, converting the reactants into products. The amount of energy that we need to put into reactants to get them into the transition state is known as the activation energy. Enzymes and all catalysts work by lowering the activation energy. This increases the rate of the reaction and makes reactions more likely to occur. When catalase is present, it's much more likely that hydrogen peroxide molecules will be converted to water and oxygen than it would be in the absence of catalase. The other thing that's important about catalysts is that they remain unchanged. This is incredibly important in cells because if enzymes were changed as a function of catalyzing their reactions, cells would then have to continuously produce new versions of those enzymes in order to catalyze the reactions that they need in order to remain alive. Enzymes can be reused to catalyze reactions over and over again. It's important to understand that enzymes do not affect delta G in the reaction. The overall energetics of the reaction remain unchanged by the enzyme. The enzyme catalyzed version of the reaction will either absorb or release as much energy as the uncatalyzed version does. The presence of the enzyme only increases the rate of the reaction. Now that we have a handle on what enzymes are, let's figure out how they work. To do this, let's take a look at an enzyme to get a handle on its structure. The region of the enzyme that is actually involved in catalyzing the reaction is referred to as the active site. This is the area of the enzyme that will interact with whatever molecules participate in the reaction. The molecules that participate in the reaction are referred to as the substrate. Notice that most of the enzyme is not actually interacting with the substrate. It's only the active site region of the enzyme that directly participates in the reaction. Most enzymes also need additional molecules in order to be functional. These can be things like cofactors, this metal ion is needed by this enzyme in order for it to work, or even organic molecules like various vitamins, which we would refer to as coenzymes, which are not shown in this diagram. It's the physical association of the substrate and the enzyme that leads to the catalysis of the reaction. The model that we use to describe this is known as the induced fit model, which we'll represent here as a cartoon. Here is a particular enzyme and its substrate. This is the active site of the enzyme. The substrate is going to physically associate with the active site. And if you weren't paying close attention, you might not have noticed that the shape of the active site changed as the substrate bound to it. Once the substrate binds to the enzyme, it forms the enzyme substrate complex. That change in the shape or the conformation of the active site as the substrate bound was what was needed to catalyze the reaction. Products are produced and when the products are released from the enzyme, the shape of the active site will go back to the conformation it had prior to the substrate binding. This is what we call the induced fit model. The shape of the substrate is what enables it to bind to the shape of the active site. And the active site's conformation prior to substrate binding is slightly different than the conformation it will take when the substrate binds. It's that change in conformation of the active site that enables the enzyme to work. If you wanna see an actual example of this, here is the conformation of the hexokinase enzyme prior to the substrate binding up on top of the image and after the substrate binds. If you look at the shape of the active site in both instances, you'll notice that there are small but noticeable changes that have occurred. Enzymes are substrate specific. 
Each enzyme works on only one molecule for the most part. There are a couple of exceptions. And we generally name enzymes using a convention where the first part of the name gives us some hint about the function of the enzyme, usually by referencing the enzyme substrate, and then ending the name with the suffix ASE. Here are a variety of different enzymes, and you can see that they all use this convention. Now that we have a handle on how enzymes work, let's talk about different environmental effects on the function of enzymes. The first effect that we'll look at is temperature. These two peaks represent the different activities of two different enzymes. Notice that their optimal temperatures are very different from each other. This is largely a function of the environments in which the organisms that use these enzymes evolved. An organism that has evolved to have an optimal internal temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, like humans for instance, will have enzymes that function optimally at that temperature. Whereas organisms that have evolved to tolerate the high temperatures found in hot springs, for example, will have enzymes that function optimally at those temperatures. To understand how this is the case, it's important to remember the effects of temperature on protein structure and function. Outside of the optimal temperature range, proteins will be denatured and their shapes will no longer allow them to function optimally. Another major environmental variable that can affect enzyme function is pH. Unlike temperature, the enzymes that are present in an organism can function optimally at widely different pH values. This, of course, is a result of the pH of the environment in which the enzyme is supposed to function. This, again, is a result of the relationship between the pH of the environment and its effect on protein structure. A third environmental variable that we'll focus on is substrate concentration. This one's a little bit different. In order to understand what's happening here, let's visualize five different enzymes as the brown blobs, catalyzing a reaction that involves these purple substrate molecules. If we keep our enzyme concentration constant and we begin to increase our substrate concentration, we'll find that initially the rate of enzyme activity increases rapidly. As we continue adding substrate molecules, we'll notice that the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction will continue to increase, but we'll begin to notice more and more pronounced leveling off. Eventually, this will get to the point where we have more substrate molecules than we have enzymes available for the catalysis. At that point, the rate of enzyme activity will level off and we will not be able to increase it past that point. There simply are not any available active sites in our enzymes for additional reactions to occur in any period of time. This results in what we would see as a classic saturation point for enzyme activity as a function of increased substrate concentration. Enzyme activity can also be affected by the presence of molecules that prevent or inhibit enzymes from catalyzing reactions. There are two major types of inhibitors that affect enzyme function. In competitive inhibition, a molecule that mimics the shape of the substrate occupies the active site and prevents the actual substrate from entering the active site for catalysis to occur. We can see that in this example where the green molecule is serving as a competitive inhibitor for the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase. The green molecule is actually a candidate drug that's being used to prevent the heightened activity of dihydrofolate reductase that's seen in several different types of cancers. In non-competitive inhibition, the inhibitor does not bind to the active site. It binds to a region of the enzyme away from the active site, but in so doing, it changes the shape of the active site so that the substrate cannot bind to it and catalysis cannot occur. This is referred to as allosteric inhibition. When the allosteric inhibitor moves away, the active site will resume its functional conformation and catalysis can occur. Non-competitive inhibition is used widely in cellular systems. Here you see two different forms of the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase, which is an enzyme that participates in cellular respiration. The inactive version is shown on the left and the active version is shown on the right. Each version is mapped against an outline of the other version to make it easier to see the change in shape that occurs as a result of the allosteric interaction in this example of non-competitive inhibition. If you're interested in where the active site is for this enzyme, you can see it circled over on the active form. Non-competitive inhibition is a major way that enzyme-mediated metabolic pathways are regulated. To use one example, let's look at the process of glycolysis, which is the first step in all respiration reactions. Starting with glucose on the top left, this graphic shows all of the different forms that that initial glucose molecule is converted into until the end of the process down on the bottom left. 
There are 10 different enzymes in glycolysis that are responsible for carrying out the 10 different chemical reactions needed to make this conversion. Each one is represented here as a series of numbered arrows. The enzymes that participate in this process are allosterically regulated through a variety of different molecules, some of which are molecules that are produced as a function of this pathway, like in the case of enzyme one, and some of which are produced by other metabolic pathways. Let's look at one specific example, enzyme three, phosphofructokinase, or PFK if we don't want to call it by its full name. Various different molecules will interact with the PFK enzyme to either shut it down and convert it into the inactive form or lock it into a more active form. By modulating the amounts of these interacting molecules that are present in the cell, the activity of PFK and therefore the activity of the entire glycolysis pathway can be either dialed up or dialed down depending upon the presence or absence of different molecules inside of the cell. The cell doesn't have to think about controlling the activity of PFK, it really can't, it's a, it's a cell, but the activity of the enzyme and the activity of the pathway can still be controlled as a function of the presence or absence of molecules present in the cell due to the cell's metabolism. This type of regulation is generally termed feedback inhibition and is the major way by which cells regulate the activity of all of the enzymes controlling all of the metabolic pathways ways that take place inside of them. Thanks so much for watching our discussion on enzymes. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain how enzyme structure and enzyme function are related. Make sure that you can describe the major environmental effects on enzyme function. Make sure that you can compare and contrast competitive and non-competitive inhibition of enzyme activity. And finally, make sure you can explain how inhibition can be used to regulate enzyme controlled metabolic pathways. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.